Greetings, mammalians. Welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. The investing podcast that will help you better understand how to make money in the stock market. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. Today is November 27th of the year 23, the last days of them. Indeed, we're getting there, getting nearly into year end. We've got a fun packed episode for you guys today. Uh, we watched a movie yesterday dumb money we'd like to chat about that we think there's some uh, some fun uh, things that happened in that film that have got some applicability to how we all think about money and investing that's right and we're calling that segment uh meat cracks pop culture because uh <laughs> in our in our jungle animal theme meat cracks are the little critters with the big eyes that often stand on top of their feet and they're always lo looking out <laughs> around uh, to, to get the lay of the land. I think Christoph means meerkats. I don't know oh, what yeah. meerkat is. Maybe meerkats live in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry there, Badger. You know, uh, <clears throat> we also want to talk about, uh, well, and Badger's going to do some schooling of, of monkeys uh behaviors uh, and then we'll give you a update on our uh king of the jungle portfolio challenge yeah look i didn't manage to get enough the juicy information out of you in episode three so i demand this week you got to tell us what you're doing with these damn options i want to understand what you've bought and is it gonna propel you into the lead or are you just burying yourself deeper and deeper as the weeks pass mm -hmm. Oh no, the dinner's mine, Luke. There's no, there's no question. But yes, I would love to help people understand the method by which I will be well fed. So I thought it would be a good idea to revisit the film Dumb Money in part because I've been watching nothing but classic films. Hitchcock. I have actually just finished watching Vertigo and North by the Northwest. So I needed something a little bit more, more of the day. And it just it put Listen, me. Oh, by the way, I, I literally just watched Stain Strangers on a Train about six days ago. So hey, we're uh -huh. in the same mind space. Oh, right yeah. on, yeah, you're right. <laughs> uh, and it, it's it's fat. Oh man, it, that film really took me back to was it 2021 January 20, yep. 2021, right? And I remember so what, what's the movie about. Like, what, what, what's going on? Just for anyone who hasn't heard of Dumb Money. That's right. It's a film about the GameStop slash Robin Hood saga in which retail investors found a way to take advantage of a massively shorted position on a dying company, allegedly dying company, GameStop, that the institutions were piling more and more into. In other words, the short interest at some point exceeded the actual shares available. And retail, one retail guy became the ringleader of uh, using social media and the and meme. I guess it was the birth of meme, the meme stock era, where using Reddit and subreddits, something called Wall Street Bets. The case, this guy, uh, he went by Roaring Kitty, made the case that wait a second, because this short position is so high, what would happen if we, we meaning retailers started buying these shares and refused to sell them as the price went up. And it turns out the strategy worked for a little while. Yeah. And it nearly broke, uh, nearly broke wall street briefly. And it certainly took one of the big firms out of the game. Was that Citadel, um, Citadel securities, they got wiped out because they had the short side of GameStop and, uh, as this army of retail investors were basically bedding the stock up and up, they got crushed. Yeah, I remember living through that. I mean, it's not that long ago. I mean, this is, I think, why I wanted to talk about it. And, and you know, it was my, to me, it was mind-blowing. Like, oh, my God, something like this could happen. And because the financial system is all connected, you know, once a big player goes down, you don't, you never know what's in their black box on their financial sheet. And then having lived through 2008, it felt like the system was wobbling. Why, what is it, uh, what value can we offer our listeners about this? It seems to me that this is really a question, brings back the question of 
is the system so rigged that an individual retail investor cannot win, even if, in a sense, they get lucky and are actually winning? I think that's the big picture question. Plot-wise, yeah. I'll, I'll say one more, one additional important point, Badger, which is that at a moment when the share price reached extraordinary highs, the institutions that were working together stepped in and precluded retailers from buying more. And that was basically what the breach of contract was, is left to their own devices, retail might have actually won, so to speak, and forced these billion dollar hedge funds or hundreds of million dollar hedge funds completely out of business. But the big boys said, "Mm -mm," you know, and that's what felt like, I think, the injustice of it. It's like, of course, of course, once the little guy finds an edge through years of work and, you know, like this coordinated effort, of course, the institutions are going to find a way out of it. And I'd, I'd noticed today, actually, um, having just rewatched the movie, that the legal case around that is ongoing right now. So just a few weeks ago, uh, apparently the U.S. Court of Appeals ha are, are now hearing might be like the third appeal where it's it's a, a, a class action, I think, I might have this not entirely correct, of retail investors accusing Citadel or, or, and some of the institutions and Robin Hood of colluding to basically stop the trading of mm. some of these meme stocks, things like GameStop, but um, also AMC and a bunch of other meme stocks. And um, yeah, and, the, and that's the that's the allegation in the, the law, law case. And I, but the um, the defendants seem to be winning. So, I'd, you know, I'm not inside that court. We're not getting too much reporting from what's happening. But evidently, there's not enough evidence that they were colluding. But that's not the core reason we're talking about this, because I think we've got an interesting debate here, perhaps, um, about are the retail investors really injured by um, dark pool trading and payment for order flow? Because that's really the allegation. So do you want to try and explain that and give us your view? Oh, I think that's above my pay grade, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know the complexities, complexities of that well enough. I did maybe two years ago. I think I'm coming at this from a slightly different level. And maybe we could return to that, Badger, after. <clears throat> I, I do have a sense that the market, the way the market actually works is different from how retail thinks it works. And consequently, what I want our listeners to take away from this is that there are, I do believe there are ways for retail investors to be successful as investors. But those strategies, you have to be very clear about how to do it. And I'm going to name the two that I see possible at the moment. One is you have to have a very long-term outlook and invest only in the best businesses, which is basically Badger, your strategy. Or you trade in uh, short time frames, but you have to have a very, very keen understanding about what your strategy is and, and proof points that it works in terms of probabilities. And this is what I'm starting to lean toward. But anything that is kind of anywhere in the middle, probably you're being manipulated in ways that you don't know, and it's not going to be f to your advantage. Yeah, okay. All right. I, we actually agree then. In, I certainly agree with the first part of what you said there, which was if you're really a long-term investor and if you're buying good quality companies and holding them for years, maybe decades, if you're getting... If you're getting like nipped and tucked on maybe the spread you're paying, um, it don't matter in the long run. It's not really going to impact your returns and your strategy. So, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about your conjecture that really short term traders uh, can avoid this either. Because if you're in and out of a position, I would imagine that makes you vulnerable, more vulnerable to uh, whatever shenanigans are happening behind the scenes. How, yeah, do, how do you think about it and how do you avoid that as a, as a, as a technical trader, do you think? 
Yeah, I think this is where it's a matter of degrees and uh, really defining that time frame. I think this is what I'm uh, I'm feeling like anything that is outside of either really long term buy and hold potentially or looking at what I would call price action, what the price is actually telling you in the moment, which is the accrual of all public and private information is located in price, but that requires a technical know-how. So unless you're doing that correctly, anything in that wide bandwidth that has people making assumptions about connections between fundamentals and well, if company X does this, then of course the price should go up here is going to be manipulated somehow and probably most likely not to your advantage. Yeah, like uh, stock prices can do pretty funky things in the short term, uh, which could be completely disconnected from the business reality of the, you know, the world and the company. But ultimately, like that saying about don't follow the dog, follow the guy who's holding the leash, ultimately the stock price will, in the long term, follow the business performance. So as a long-term investor, as a badger, rather than a monkey, um, things are rigged in your favor, not against your favor, I think. And that remains, yeah, I mean, that's the investing style I've <laughs> grown up in the wilds of the jungles with. Um, I think that to land this plane here, I'm starting to get, and this is what the movie did for me, it re-raised the scepter of skepticism where as we enter the age of AI and it feels like the fundamental nature of investing has changed so much with all the information that's out there and how it's being used. I got this un unsavory feeling in my tummy, Badger, that maybe there's more rotten bananas out there than ever and that the that the odds are increasingly stacked against the retail investor and that one needs to be very careful going forward as things continue to change and, and be mindful of ways in which the way things look might not be how they actually are. And I'll say more about this in a bit with, uh, when we talk about why I'm using options in the way I am. But, you know, as a, if you're listening to this podcast and maybe if you're perhaps a, a less experienced investor, like you can, as long as you approach being an investor diligently and in the right way, uh, you can avoid all of these issues. Like find great quality companies, do your own due diligence, like go to primary sources. There's a ton of regulations in place that, that ensure that accurate public information is available to you. But if you read other analysts, or if you look at stock prices and you try and, you know, your, your, your decision making is driven by factors that, uh, that can be influenced by the market. That's when you kind of put yourself in the danger zone. If you do this stuff right, you can absolutely beat the market. You can absolutely make astounding returns over an investing lifetime, but you got to do the hard work. You can't just, uh, rock up on wall street bets and then, uh, you know, place your investments based on what some crazy dude is telling you. Right. I think it comes down to really knowing, yeah, you can't wing it. <clears throat> and and really knowing, uh, may, there's different levels of really knowing too. It, it, maybe, maybe the lesson from my end is it's very, very healthy to be skeptical at this juncture of the mm -hmm. investing, what, in, you know, what investing looks like. And one way to bridge that uh, skepticism is, as Badger was saying, do things in terms of quality. And that starts with something like basic fundamental research and building confidence in what you yeah. own. We, we do a bunch of this research for a company we support, Seven Investing. And if you're looking for a source of like primary investment research on some of the world's most fantastic companies, go check out seveninvesting.com. Um, uh, there are some um, fantastic options on the scorecard. If you're not out there scanning the market yourself and you're looking for like a step up, well worth a look. Hey, so we were talking there about uh, the game being rigged, but um, to bring us on to our next topic, 
Christoph, you were trying to rig this game, our <laughs> King of the Jungle challenge. We did. I picked you up on it in episode three. I want to go a bit deeper this week. Now, let me remind you of the rules we set. A thousand dollars each on day one, one hundred dollars per month ongoing. Whoever has the the greatest investment account returns after one year wins the fancy dinner. Now, what happened? You traded yourself into the hole, and then you said, "Let's rack up the stakes. Let's do two hundred dollars a month." <laughs> what was your motivation there? Dear dear listeners, <clears throat> my motivation is to uh, entertain you <laughs> and to provide <laughs> and to give give uh, our give you more uh, options in terms of you know what we're buying to keep things lively. Uh, I like you know I like uh, swinging from the trees, and I you know f- for your benefit, I want to liven things up a little bit. But our stodgy badger over here, uh, stickler for the rules, yada yada, <laughs> thinks that that request came from myself trading poor humble monkey trading himself into a hole. That could not be further from the truth. <laughs> Although my start is a little inauspicious, I, I think uh, legitimately I just wanted to have uh, a little bit more um, leeway into uh, into the. I mean, a hundred dollars. How to say this? I guess it's moot because if we're buying fractional shares, then then that amount is not particularly relevant. But I tend to think in whole shares, and I don't like the fractional share stuff. So I thought, well, two hundred bucks per month would, yeah, yeah, just give us more options to play with. But I'm firmly chastised. I'll <laughs> abide by the rules that we set to your entertainment detriment, dear listeners. <laughs> just if you're not entertained enough, blame Badger. That's all I'm saying. I don't want you throwing this excuse at me at your end. When uh, when you're buying me the dinner, like oh we should have tried, we should have gone bigger. <laughs> when I was behind, I, you know I've uh, I've seen this story before in the world of poker. One of my buddies is an incredible gambler, uh, but his if he's if he's on a losing streak, which happens, he's incredibly volatile. If he's losing over the course of a night, he's racking the stakes up and he's pushing pushing the limits as much as he can. Come on, guys, let's let's allow the straddle, the super straddle. Let's uh, come on. Let's let's rack it up to uh, five, ten, ten, twenty. Uh, let's have a like side bets. He's trying to push the numbers up because that's the only way he's going to get himself unstuck. You are not going to do that to me in this game. You got to win your dinner fair and square. <laughs> These accusations are so unsavory. All of a sudden, your humble your humble swinging monkey is now a degenerate gambler. All of a sudden, after after three weeks into the contest, my goodness, I'm not worried. I am not worried. I just, I just wanted to to give us more room to play. That's all. I'm a fun loving, uh, uh, you know. I'm fun loving. I, I <laughs> I'm not just gonna sit there and twiddle my thumbs. But fair, but fair enough. You know what? Six months from now, you'll wish we had up the t- <laughs> up the monthly <laughs> stakes. So this this is permanent record right here. You got you got to play your cards as they lie, buddy. But there is actually an interesting uh, psychological effect here, maybe that we're we're seeing organically. And if you're an investor, like if you've got a losing position, then the temptation, your emotions are telling you, "Oh, double down! Come on, when it comes back, we're going to get our money back." You just like go stick some more in, stick some more in, and um, you know that's that's potentially very destructive like chasing your losers in that way that can really turn a small loss into a very big loss and it's particularly true in investing because it's not like flipping coins or betting on black at roulette uh, you know it's going to come in it's going to come in black eventually um investing isn't like that where everything is like a 50 50 if it goes down it's as likely to go back up actually if a stock valuation is going down on the balance of probabilities, that's because the company is in trouble. It could be weird things happening, but you know, if the comp- if the thesis is not intact and the stock price is going down, it's probably going to keep going down. So this is a world where um, continuing to chase your losers 
is much more damaging than perhaps chasing your losers in a casino where there's a known house edge, but at some point, you know, your color is going to come in eventually if you can make your bankroll last long enough. And you know, that is the actual reason I wanted to increase the, the amount. So the counter to what Badger just said is I wanted to buy more shares of Coherus as you, uh, in this part of the contest, you know, that's my biggest position, right? And that's, this is the one where you bought 42% of your portfolio in Coherus on day one. You want to put some more in 42 is not enough for you. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Because, <laughs> because it's, it's what, it's what Badger is uh, warning you not to do when the thesis is broken. In Coherus Biosciences, it's the opposite. The thesis is not only fully intact, it's more intact than it's ever been, but the market does not see that. So this is one of those cases where I will not let risk aversion override my deep understanding of this company and the high probability that the market will re-rate the company once it sees what I know to be true. So probabilities, I use both, uh, both of these words maybe lightly because probabilities you never know for sure. And also at some point you have to make, like in poker, right? It's all probabilities. When you have a certain hand, you have to play it even though aces, kings lose all the time. This is one of those moments where I think my confidence in the high probability likeliness likelihood of a re-rate is coming and I want to take advantage of it because it won't last forever. One of those delta moments. Okay. But, but yeah, okay. but Badger, you're exactly right. That is very different. Very, very different from doubling down on a company that you start hoping will recover, even though the results themselves are problematic. Yeah. It's a subtle right. difference I hope, but uh, I to understand. Yeah. I I don't know too much about Coherus and I very much hope this turns around for you. And if it wins you a dinner, like, great, right. Um, but I will just say that there is a stock that Christoph is banned from mentioning the ticker of in this episode, but there is, we've heard this story before listeners. And he was saying the same things about this company in the tail episodes of the no limit podcast. And in episode one and two, I think of Wall street wildlife, this is the stock that shall not be named, but I believe you were very bullish because you knew more than the market and possibly you're retracting that position now. That's true. That's true. There is a subtle difference in the stock that shall not be named. That <laughs> remained a, in a sense, binary outcome where the thesis was not broken. It was just always binary. And it just for the moment went the other way against me. In the case of Coherus, it is not a broken thesis. So okay. it is, yeah, subtleties. But Badger is right to ask all these questions. You you do the the main lesson is do not double down on losers. And if you do find situations where you're confident in your knowledge, even though it remains probabilistic, my strategy is to bet heavier in those instances because that is how you get big delta over the market. That's cool. And I do the same thing, but my version of heavy is like five or six percent. Whereas yours is like fifty or sixty percent, so I mean you. And that's right. why, if we add two hundred dollars a month, and the, <laughs> and the then the percentage goes down. You see, you see. <laughs> uh, you know, being honest, I'm not so worried about like winning or losing the game. I'm more worried about your ability to con to live your life, pay the bills, and continue on the podcast with me. If you're destitute and you have to sell the house uh, and you, your marriage breaks up because of your very poor risk management decisions and your real portfolio, like yeah. the, the Wall Street wildlife is over before it started. So don't do that. Don't blow yourself up. <laughs> <clears throat> I thought, isn't there room on the jungle floor uh, in Badger's <laughs> lair? <laughs> don't, you, <laughs> don't you have some extra bananas you could feed me for breakfast for a few weeks as I settle, as I settle things up? Um, all right, so <clears throat> we're approaching uh, we're approaching our our uh, attempt at keeping things under half an hour. So why don't uh, I update our listeners about my strategy, portfolio strategy, which includes 
two option calls. And so let's put this uh, let's put this up on the screen. Here's what things Sweet. look like. Oh, look at that. So tell us about that graph on the uh, the right hand side. And then you can tell us what you did. Uh, yeah, th th that's uh, uh, those are two lines that show a very temporary snapshot about our current portfolio values. Uh, if you're uh, if you're listening, if you're not on YouTube and you're joining on audio only, uh, Christoph has produced a beautiful spreadsheet that's now tracking our individual investment portfolios in the King of the Jungle Challenge. Uh, if you can imagine two lines, one of which uh, is the badgers, and it's just climbing nice and gently uh, northwards. And I believe I'm I'm up from my initial thousand dollars to maybe a thousand and sixty, something like that. And if you, you might recall his exuberance on episode two, where he was uh, like $80, eighty dollars up in a week. So yeah, you can see this beautiful hump where he's up and winning, and now he's in the hole and he's way below his starting point. Just a temporary snapshot in time with one one gray line slightly <laughs> above the yellow line, soon to course correct in the other direction. That's all. Uh, listeners, I want to tell you about my second largest position, which uh, at the moment is, it's a little complicated, but not really. Uh, the official position is in KRE, September 20th of 24, $30 puts. And so this is uh, an ETF that has collected regional banks and regional banks specifically have a lot of exposure to the commercial real estate industry. Mm. My genuine uh, outlook right now is more bearish and more scared of the macro picture than it's been since 2008. I see massive amounts of red flashing lights about all kinds of fiscal problems. And so this position was opened up to go short this regional bank ETF. When you buy a put that is an option contract that profits when the underlying shares go down. So my thesis is that between now and September of 24, we will have a very significant downturn in the market. And my thesis further is that one area that will be hit the hardest will be some of these smaller banks that are suffering because of all the, their exposure to bonds and higher interest rates that their balance sheets are in deep, deep trouble. And knowing what I, what I see in uh, commercial real estate, meaning that buildings are empty and landlords are having a hard time filling these spaces, that that will be another domino, which will cause severe pressure on these regional banks. Some of which I think will be, will collapse. Therefore, dropping the price and making me benefit, making this short position benefit on the way down. I, I really like it. That's, I totally support that thesis that, that that's playing out now. I suppose the question as an option buyer, the question is the extent to which that kind of bearishness around regional banks is already baked in to the option, the way the options priced the valuation. Cause I imagine that's going to be a pretty volatile um, uh, position to take out a bet on. That's right. This is the hardest thing about options and this this bet. Uh, I obviously bought it before the big market rally, so my timing was off. And with things like macro, systemic issues often take longer than you think, yeah. and or the timing is unknown because they it is a complex system. That's why I went as long out as I did September. That gives me essentially close to a year for this to, to play out. And so what do I think will happen in the market in, in December? I actually think it's going to go up some more, but the more goes up, hoping uh, I might actually add to this position at an even better option price. But the other thing about options, by the way, 
is that they, because they're leveraged, they benefit quicker, more quickly to the upside and downside. So right now I'm losing to Badger by quite a bit because on the way down, the gains are accentuated. But, But if I'm right, when the market turns down, which I'm predicting in turn, intuitively will happen starting somewhere in late January, February, then these options will pick up steam on the way down. Yeah, good. Okay, okay. Yeah, let's see. Oh, that'd be an interesting one to watch. Thanks for explaining that. Will, will you uh, tell us about WISE? Yeah, uh, I... I... So I bought five things at the start of the contest. I was keeping some money on the sidelines, which is my way of managing volatility, because I also think um, valuations are a bit stretched right now. So I wanted to keep a bit of uh, fuel to burn in the future. Uh, But I invested another $100, 10% of my portfolio, into a UK company, a fintech called Wise. And I mean, if you travel, if you do international personal travel or business internationally this is just such a fantastic um business proposition i'm a screaming advocate for this company Uh, i do my business banking and my personal banking with wise now essentially it started off as low cost money transfer like cutting the fx rate that you pay so if i wanted to send a hundred bucks to christoph maybe to contribute to his uh, banana pile because he can't afford to pay the bills because he's blown himself up with the stock that shall not be named. If I sent him that $100 by PayPal or by a regular bank transfer or something else, then even though many of these guys say, oh, you know, fee-free, free transfers, they're caning you on the spread. They're caning you on the FX rate. Um, if you do a transfer with Wise or a number of other competing fintechs who've got the same model now, uh, you get the mid-rate. You know, if you go, if you go Google... Um, tell me what $100 is in sterling, you're going to get one number. That's like the mid rate, the true rate right now. You'll get that rate on WISE and they're going to charge you a transparent fee, which is currently 0.74%. So pretty small number. It's just a great way to manage your money, to travel internationally, to hold a balance. They've got a whole ton of new facilities that I absolutely love in terms of being able to keep my balance fully invested in the MSCI World Index they're kind of paying me a proxy of for interest in, in that respect. I love it. Um, and then if you look at the company themselves, like they put in a recent half yearly results just a few weeks ago and results kind of blew the market out of the water again. They, they're they really, really killing it. They're making a, an absolute ton in interest income right now because they're holding so much money on their balance sheet because people like me are so enthusiastic and they're like, hey, look, hold my money for me because you're just doing such a great job. Um, and wiser, the, the, the biggest struggle they have right now is they're trying to find ways within their existing banking licenses to give that money back to customers because they're all about trying to be customer friendly and essentially get all this free marketing and word of mouth, um, of people telling each other, like I'm telling you right now about what a fantastic, uh, company this is and fantastic proposition this is. So, um, the numbers look great. I love the strategy. There have been some wobbles in the leadership team, some question marks around uh, the CEO. Um, but I think that's they've companies almost put those uh, days behind it. And uh, I, this is one of my highest conviction stock picks. Badger, if if uh, if somebody wanted to buy shares, it's not the simplest ticker to follow. At least if you're if you're U.S. based. I know on Robinhood, I don't think you can buy it. And I had quite the adventure trying to find the appropriate ticker to use for our spreadsheet. I ended up with WPLCF. If you want to buy WISE, I would say if you can, buy the primary listing in London, which is london.wise. Uh, but if, you, if you're in the US and you're on Robinhood and they don't offer that market, then you can buy the ADR. There's two. There's one called WISE and there's another one called uh, WO. PLCF, whatever that one was. I'll tell you the difference next episode. Uh, It's quite interesting how ADRs work. All right. So if you like what we talked about this episode, make sure you go to YouTube, Wall Street Wildlife. And if uh, you can also find us on Spotify at wallstreetwildlife.com, right? That's that's, uh, the website that takes you to our Spotify feed, correct? That's right. Yeah. We're on all the major podcast platforms. 
Um, I've also been beavering away uh, on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, a bunch of other threads, a bunch of other social networks, uh, posting videos, posting content. So go find us. We're at Wall Street Wildlife on pretty much all of those. As well as on Substack and Patreon. So Google Wall Street Wildlife and then click all of the like buttons and, and subscribe to all the things to, to help Badger and Monkey employed bringing you the goods about the wilds of investing in the markets. And do tweet us. Uh, I'm at 7 Luke Hallard. And I am at 7 Flying Platypus. We've got, a, we've got a whole bunch of stuff going on there right now. If you go check out the Wall Street Wildlife community on Twitter slash X, there's a, uh, a poll. Are you Team Badger or Team Monkey for the Portfolio Challenge? Um, yeah, there's only one right answer to that. So go go and, <laughs> and, and, <laughs> go and, go and, and answer that correctly. Okay, my friend. Uh, boys and girls, are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.